fundamentally, when you have that state, you become a lot more efficient. You function at a different level. You lose yourself in flow with so much more ease and you feel this sense of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. So that fuels you, that keeps you going, that gives you energy. When did you first noticed, notice that sparked feeling within yourself? Do you remember that moment in time when you were like, this is it, this is what I've been looking for? Like for me, when I first started, when I met my meditation teacher, when I moved to LA in 2002 and I was like in his presence and I was like, that's the, that's what the way he's making me feel is the way I want to make other people feel. And, you know, my whole life sort of trajectory shifted in that moment. What was your moment? You know, um, for me, it, it wasn't an association of work as a kid. I was always making stuff uh -huh. and that the feeling of being able to create um, very often working with my hands. I love the physical act of creation. Um, it brought me to that place that I still yearn to go today. Um, and I've since upon spending a lot of time reflecting and, and deconstructing what is that state, what goes into it, what are the components, realize that, you know, even though I didn't call that work as a kid, nobody was paying me to do it. You know, I was investing effort fiercely, often for days and days and days. I would lose myself. Yeah. Um, and I was working hard, you know? So when I talk about work also, it probably makes sense to share that um, I'm not necessarily talking about the thing you get paid to do. It's really nice when it is, um, <laughs> but um, I use the word more generally as <clears throat> really um, any way that you uh, choose to invest effort, to invest yourself in the process of, of devoting effort, you know, that's work, that takes work. Um, and when we can do that in a way that, that makes us feel alive and also be compensated for it, or, you know, that's an amazing thing because then it can sustain us in different ways. Um, but so, you know, when I talk about, you know, I worked hard to make a lot of different things as a little kid, you know, some of it I was paid for, some of it not. Um, I also painted uh, album covers on jean jackets when I was in high school to make my walking around money in addition to other things. And I would lose days in the basement, just painting. Um, and so that state to me is kind of magical. So when you asked me, when did I first know, I knew that things like that made me feel a way that I want to feel from my earliest memories. Um, but the notion of that becoming, of having that feeling in my work, um, you know, probably touched down for real when I was um, DJing in college because I would just completely lose myself in that experience. Mm. Um, it was, it was a, an incredible thing to do. Um, and that was, you know, literally like, um, that was my work. That was my, you know, I, I was building a company at the same time. So the notion that I could potentially have that feeling of doing something that would support me mm -hmm. was, that was probably like where it really touched down in a more, in a way where I would associate those things with each other. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking is, I think a lot of us have uh, childhood memories of using our imagination and playing, you know, fantastical games and really being in the moment, but then we lose it as we yeah. get become adults mm -hmm. and we get bogged down in the slog of just day to day, nine to five. And not a lot of us regain it. And I feel like that's what your current work is, is here to help us do. Um, and, and maybe even develop language around it so we can articulate it for ourselves. So it, we don't have to think it's our imagination that, you know, this is something that's nudging me or urging me or pulling me towards this, this way of life. Um, so I guess that's what I'm asking is when did you rediscover it as an adult? Was it when you owned a yoga studio or, and you, you saw that probably. community getting built? Yeah, it was probably as a yoga studio. Cause I definitely did not have it when I was practicing law. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, it was almost the exact opposite of it. You know, like I would, I would think that I was there for eight hours and it was an hour, which is you know, sort of an awful experience. Um, and it was, yeah, it was the yoga um, actually. Cause in the world, like in the fitness world, although that was more of a business, like I learned a ton um, from building my own facility. Um, and there was a lot of fun. Um, but I think really like the deeper sense of showing up and feeling like I'm doing the thing I'm here to do was really probably touched back down in, uh, in the yoga experience. Um, in no small part also, because I think part of it is I was 
you know, it was a blend of entrepreneurship, which I love this process of creation, you know, um, it was, you know, I'm every, every day, cause I was teaching also, I'm literally stepping onto a floor and I'm creating a moment or experience, not dissimilar to way back in the DJ, you know, experience. Right. Um, and, and I'm seeing the effect. It, it, it took me somewhere. Like I would blink and I'd, you know, be teaching a 90 minute class. And I would literally like, I taught in a way that forced me to be hyper present and to be in a flow state the entire time, you know? So I didn't, I would teach. And if you stopped me, you know, 48 minutes into a 90 minute class and said, what are you going to say next? And, and what sequence or, or posture uh, are you going to um, offer next to your students? I couldn't tell you. Mm. It was a hundred percent in the moment. I was in the room with everybody scanning to try and like to, to feel into what they needed at any given moment in time. And just, you know, I would give them uh, what I hoped was what they needed. Um, and I was, you know, I, I was nowhere else. There, there were times where I would step onto a floor feeling terrible. I mean, brutal headache. But as soon as I started into class, like everything else vanished away. You know, I was in that state. Um, and I would step out then and have to, you know, like the toilet be overflowing because I was an entrepreneur and like we had three people working there. <laughs> I had to go and plunge it. But, you know, um, it was part of that whole, you know, um, there was enough of the stuff that was amazing that took me there. Um, in the context of the reality of, you know, like building a business um, that, uh, yeah, that, that was probably the thing that really reminded me of who I was and what was possible, like that you could feel this way in the context of the central thing that you do. Right. And talk about the genesis of the name Sparkotype. Where were you? How did that name come about? Because that's a freaking genius name, man. Yeah. You must have it's been kind of like a- so stoked when you, when you came up with that name. It's kind of a fun name. And I was actually with, um, uh, I, it just kind of dropped into my head and then I ran it by, um, there's a couple of dads who uh, I've been in a mastermind with for years. And, um, and we always go around, like we, every month and a half we'd meet and share what we're working on. And it's like, you know, I've been working on this and, <clears throat> and they knew I was working on the ideas for it for a long time. But I was like, the name Sparkotype just kind of dropped into my head. Cause there are archetypes for work that sparks you. And they were like, Oh, 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 that. <laughs> Um, and I was like, oh, you think it's cool? Um, but uh, yeah, and it really is just, I got curious about like whether there was an a, um, identifiable set of impulses for work that make everybody come alive. Like, you know, is, is there a fairly universal set of impulses? So I started doing all this research around it. And, and once I identified those, I also realized that each one of them came with its own quirky set of tendencies and preferences and behaviors that formed archetypes. So I was like, oh, so this is kind of like the archetype for work that sparks you. And that's where it just kind of all came together. I was like, ooh, sparkotypes. That makes sense. It's fun and easy too. So, uh, and, then, and then the business mind in me kicks in. I was like, yeah, that feels good. <laughs> so are you, were you one of those, what's your astrology? What's your zodiac sign type of people? Or, no. Or have you ever <laughs> been in that whole? No. I'm, I mean, I'm definitely spiritually curious, um, but I'm also like, having lived my entire adult life until recently in New York city, I I'm probably spiritually curious and, um, and also, um, uh, optimistically skeptical, <laughs> mm. you know, I always want to know what's happening underneath the hood. Um, and, uh, I'm open to the fact there are things that, that are true that we can't necessarily explain, but I always want to try and explain them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I took more of a scientific approach to all of this work. I was like, okay, so I don't know if these impulses were, are, are, are actually there, but if I could, if they were, and I could, and I could map them and then build tools around them to help people identify what theirs is, I think that would really be helpful. It would be helpful for me if I had that tool, which is often where ideas start and maybe it'd be helpful for other people. So I literally just started with lists of like, you know, like thousands of different jobs and titles and I kept asking, what are the fundamental ways that we exert ourselves within this role? You know, not the surface level job description, but what are the fundamental sort of like units of effort that go into this? And in an astonishingly fast amount of time, it distilled down to a very small set of these impulses that show up in different mixes and different roles and jobs and titles and industries. And um, I just kept conflating it and conflating it and like distilling it until it landed at 10 um, I've, I've shared elsewhere. I actually really hate the fact that it's 10 
because it feels way too slick. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, the scientist side of my brain like holds open the possibility that maybe, you know, with more research down the road, um, that number will shift. But for now, that's sort of where I've landed. So you've written several books at this point. You've run yoga studios. You've started in other businesses. You have a podcast. You have the adult day camp. Um, how, where did you find time to sit down and pull out some paper and a pen and whatever you use to record all this stuff? And I mean, that's a pretty massive undertaking. Not yeah, knowing if so, it was going to work out or not. Like, what what was that about? What was driving it's big, that? It's been a big <laughs> undertaking for sure. Um, and it's been uh, not necessarily a, a life that is entirely, you know, like balanced for for windows of that. Um, and uh, and you're but, a dad, you're a husband, you know, so you yeah, can't leave that and, out either. Right. And and those are to me, those are my central devotions. You know, everything mm-hmm. else is is secondary to family. Um, but I think I've just learned to really let go of a lot of stuff that um, that doesn't that doesn't call to me. Um, I'm really good at starting things. And then the minute they show that they don't have legs or they're not going to make me feel the way I want to feel, letting, just letting them go. Mm. Um, I think you kind of have to do that as an entrepreneur, as a founder. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, so I basically, I'm, I'm really good at, at starting things, trying them, treating them as experiments. And then as soon as they show they don't have legs, letting them go. And, and I've done that a lot, but you know, my main company, Good Life Project at the time, um, you know, it's really been running for almost a decade. Um, mm-hmm. We have good systems and we have great people um, so that I have a certain amount of freedom to do other things. And this, the work around the sparkotypes became something that I was really just deeply drawn to. So you were sparked, um, you were sparked to do. Yeah, I was. And, and what, you know, and fundamentally when you have that state, you know, you become a lot more efficient. You function at a different level. You lose yourself in flow with so much more ease and you feel a sense of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. So that fuels you, that keeps you going, that gives you energy, you know, and the very state that I was investigating and trying to map and define and build tools around was the state that I was in when I was doing this work. Um, So it allowed me, you know, to, to deepen into it and still, to still feel really good doing it. And, um, but it was, there were definitely moments that have been hard. <clears throat> where, um, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, and I felt like I've definitely pushed a little bit too far over the edge of, um, mm-hmm. not being happy and I'm doing mm-hmm. too much at once. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of like regularly titrating that and figuring out how do I pull back or how do I bring different people onto the team, um, mm-hmm. where everything can hum on a different level. Um, but it's definitely been a huge, it's been a fairly, um, big lift. Um, you know, now <clears throat> once these things start to really demonstrate a lot of power in 2018, we built an assessment, but spent almost an entire year building the spark type assessment. We launched it out into the world. Um, and when we saw the response to it, like, as I have this conversation with you, we're probably closing in on 600,000 people having completed this assessment, you know, like over 30 million data points, it became really clear that it was its own thing and its own body of work. And it would need its own tools and devotion and team. So we split it into its own company. So I'm now effectively running two companies, Good Life Project and Spark Endeavors um, <laughs> with their own teams. And, um, and that is not the happiest place for me, to be honest. So like once we, so I, I'm in a window right now where I have to kind of figure that out. Um, right. Because, uh, you know, I want to be able to do more of the things that I love to do and less of the things that I don't. And when you're in a startup mode with anything, which functionally I am again, you don't necessarily have that choice. You know, you wear hats that um, don't come naturally to you. You wear hats that sometimes empty you out, but it's in the name of building something you, you believe deeply in, still spending more time doing the things that do fill you up and knowing that you're building something that um, you expect will allow you to effectively buy yourself out of the things that, that empty you out uh, at a certain point. So, you know, I'm, I'm literally in that space right now of running one company, which has been around for a decade and, um, and building uh, a new company from the ground up as around this body of work, which has had so much traction that is sort of like this, this is a thing that has to be. Well, that's what's so awesome about it is that it's the whole, you know, axiom of give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish, feed him for life. So you're literally gifting people with this 
basically a system of showing them how they think about things and what they can excel at based on that particular arc or spark type and based on their impulses and their preferences and all of these things so that it empowers them to be able to go out and really feel like whatever I'm doing now, guess what? I've always actually been on purpose. I just didn't know, I didn't have language for it. And I feel like yeah. that is usually the missing, that's one of the missing components to kind of give us permission because society is not going to give us permission to follow our heart or be on purpose or to you know do what we're passionate about but if we just have language for it and we see that actually i'm not the only one who thinks like a scientist or like a maven or like a maker or, you know these kinds of things it's like wow it, it kind of helps to helps us to sort of give ourselves permission to take those next steps and to really double down on what we're already interested in doing yeah it's beautifully said you know and that it's exactly on point. You know, the, the thing that people has reflected back to us about this work more than anything else is people say they feel seen. Mm. Right. Um, and, and it's interesting because it's, they're talking about a body of work and a tool and, you know, like now a book, which gives a lot more detail and nuance, but fundamentally they're like, Oh, you know, like this is not necessarily something that's new to me, but it's, it's incredibly validating that it's real and it's true. And it's giving me language that describes it in a way that I haven't had before. So I can actually understand this myself on a much deeper level. And also I now have language to share this thing that's inside of me with other people and describe it in a way that's much more articulated and understandable. So people can really understand who I am and how I move into the world. And also it equips me to understand more what to say yes or no to so that those fleeting moments when I've done things in the past and it gives me that feeling of just being utterly alive and in the moment and on purpose, you know, now I have a much better understanding of why I felt that way and a much better understanding of what to look for in the future um, or create in the future that will be more likely to give me that feeling again. And to me, you know, that's, um, that's a cool place to be functioning. It's a cool place for me to actually, you know, like be stepping into a, building a body of work and building a business and, um, and being of service, you know, at a time right now where I think we need we need to explore these questions and we are exploring them um, more than any other time in my life that I remember. Right. And it's about purpose. It's not like, you know, you, you read your daily horoscope and it tells you, you know, you're going to have good luck today. It's, it's not really practical <laughs> information, yeah. but what you're providing us with is very practical, actionable, executable um, information about what we're here to do. And just to use myself as a case study, I recently redid the assessment and, um, so you go to this website, uh, sparkatype.com. Is that the website? Yep. Yep. And there are a series of questions. You start at 9%, which I thought was odd. Like, what, why, why do you start at 9%? Oh, it's just, just to the make first people page. feel like they've, they've gotten a little, yeah. little yeah, progress no, just there. The, the, when you finish the first page of, of the assessment, then that you're at 9%. So <laughs> okay. I was like, this is awesome. I haven't done anything. I'm already at 9%. Right. Progress. I'm just winning already. That. Also. <laughs> And then you answer a series of questions, which seems like I'm sure there's some sort of scientific rationale between asking the same sort of question in a few different ways to kind yeah. of make sure people don't allow their bias to um, influence their answers. Yeah. And it's also like part of the, the language, the prompts are built around um, teasing out when you have felt states that have some level of overlap, like, like meaningfulness and purpose mm -hmm. and access to flow, um, uh, express potential um, and excitement and energy. And so there's overlap in some of these states. So we come at it, like basically the, the, the assessment is designed to come at it from a number of different angles to try and sort of like um, try and refine um, your answers and, and tease out how you feel about certain ways of, uh, of exerting yourself. Right. And then I finished it and said, I'm a maker. Uh, that's my primary scientist is my shadow and, and perform per, performer mm -hmm. is, is anti? my anti. <laughs> so what does yeah, that yeah. mean so, really quickly? So your primary is think of it as your strongest impulse for work that makes you come alive. So like it's the creating things, the creative mm -hmm. impulse, the shadow is not like the young in shadow. It's the, the impulse that lives in the shadow of the right. primary. So you can think of it as your runner up or right, your secondary. A lot, yeah. A lot of people feel like there's a relationship too, where you do the work of your shadow 
and because it helps you do the work of your primary better. So for you, you problem solve, you figure things out because it helps you step into the creative process at a higher level. And then your anti spark type is the work that is the heaviest lift, takes the most recovery, mm -hmm. um, and so true. very often the greatest amount of external motivation. Um, mm -hmm. So for you, the performer, which is all about, you know, um, like like animating, enlivening, energizing interactions, mm -hmm. moments, or experiences, being very very front and center often, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't do it, and it doesn't mean that it's not a part of your work. It just means that. Um, there's something that requires, it takes more out of you and it requires more, more recovery when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I was hosting these events for five years called the shine in New York yeah. and in LA. And, uh, and I didn't ever, I never wanted to be the host. I wanted to be the behind the scenes person. Mm. And those things would just wear me out because it's just not what I'm not really when I'm, when I would, I prefer to, I'd rather I'm like you, I'm an introvert actually. Yeah. <laughs> but I felt like no one else could do that better than me. So it really resonated, the maker, the scientist. I actually wanted to be a lot of these uh, categories. There's the essentialist, yeah. there's performer, there's the warrior, there's the sage. I thought for sure I'd have some sage energy, but apparently not. There's the advisor, the advocate, and the nurturer and the maven, so. Yeah, and, and by the way, like, you know, the fact that, um, you know, we give you basically the two strongest ends of the spectrum, that doesn't right. mean that you don't also have some sage in you. You know, True. we were just, the, the assessment is designed to tease out the strongest impulses. So you're like, you know, like you could still have this impulse for Sage, but it's not showing up as the strongest thing. Now you're a life, you describe yourself as a lifelong New Yorker. Are you, did you, were you born in New York? So, um, I grew up just outside. I grew up in a suburb outside of New York, um, on Long Island. And, and I spent my entire adult life in New York until a year ago, but I grew up in a, I grew up in the town. If you ever read The Great Gatsby as a kid, um, sure. it was centered in these two towns, East Egg and West Egg. And those are actually based on real towns. And um, I, I grew up in what would be the real the real life East Egg, which is a town called Port Washington. But it was so that was that town in the novel was actually based on the town that I grew up in. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so when you think back to your earliest memories in uh, in Port Washington, what was your favorite toy or activity as a child? Oh, man. Um, I love to make stuff. Uh, it almost didn't matter what it was. Um, but um, I got drawn to bicycles. Um, and not just as a toy, but as a, for some odd reason, as a, a focus of intrigue, of curiosity, of fascination. So I love to ride bikes. I'm a typical kid. I love like riding my bikes around, like crashing them all, all over the place. Um, and then I started making bikes. Even as like a young kid, I would, I would. You were like Mad parents. Max in your neighborhood. I read. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> I, I, Cause you know, we, we had, it was like an oddly sort of like classic old school upbringing. Um, at least for me, um, you know, there's a town dump in the town that I grew up in and, and every Sunday, everyone would like bring all their stuff down there. And, and, and I'd like get my parents to sort of like, you know, drag me down there. And, um, I just go picking through old bike parts, like in old bicycles that got thrown out and we'd throw them all in the back of the, you know, the beat up old Chevy blazer and drive back home. And I'd spend the day duct taping them and like gluing them together. And, you know, trying to make a Franken bike that I could ride around the neighborhood. Um, and this is like right. at a really young age also. Um, so I'd be like cruising the neighborhood with, you know, like some beat up old <clears throat> cobbled together, half Sears, half Schwinn Stingray with like three sets of forks, like to, like like a massive chopper on the front end and different size tires. And and they would last a hot minute until they imploded. Um, but uh, that was, a, a, I, for some reason I loved, um, I love bikes. I do to this day, you know, um, I've, I've been a cyclist in various different ways um, my whole life. And I've been um, building, not recently, but, up, you know, for a large chunk of my life, I was like working on bikes and building bicycles. And um, uh, th there's some of that. I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that came to mind to me when you asked that question. I mean, there's probably a ton of other yeah, no, I that's 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 cool. I know yeah. your your mom was you described her as a hippie and she was really into clay and stuff like that. Do you feel like you inherited your 
your creativity from her or where did that come from? Your, your, yeah, it's a, you know, I don't, I don't, it's a really good question to try and identify where it comes from. Um, it was certainly encouraged. I mean, I saw her from the earliest days. She was a potter when I was really young, yeah. you know, so the, the downstairs of our house was this old basement that was a little bit scary, but um, she turned it into a, a pottery studio where she had um, like, I'm, I'm remembering it now walking down the stairs and there was always like the, a little bit of clay dust floating in the air. Like you could see the, you know, like the old, lights and there was always like a little bit you could kind of see the light because there was clay dust refracting it and a bunch of electric wheels lined up and this massive old kick wheel back in the corner with like a 250 pound cement flywheel that you would kick really really hard to get it going and then it would just stay going because it was so massive and a, um and a, like rows of industrial shelving with glass mason jars filled with chemicals that she would use for glazes and and a little bit away from the house, she had this giant gas fired kiln that would take like 18 hours to fire that literally was big enough. You know, it was huge. Um, and, and she would, that was like her happy place. She would steal away there, you know, and she would just, you'd hear the whir of the wheel going downstairs and you know, she was in a space of creativity. Um, and I used to, you know, love just hanging out around that. So, um, whether, you know, I got it from her or whether I was just exposed to the love of vanishing into a space of creativity from the earliest age and I saw what it did to her. I'm not sure if I can tease those two out, but it was probably some blend of that, you know. I'm wired in a lot of ways very similarly to the way that she is. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to this day, you know, like my mom is still, you know, like very thankfully with us and um, she has she no longer uh, works with clay, but she works with bees and she makes the most extraordinary, intricate beaded pieces of, I mean, it's, you would, you might call it jewelry, but they're like these incredible display pieces that would take months and months and months to work on a single piece. Um, so it's always been a part of her life and I've always seen that in her. And I, I would have to imagine in some way, shape or form, it gave me, um, it, it let me see how that can make you feel. And it gave me permission to start to play in that mm. domain myself. You describe your dad as a, a quotes, mad professor. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So my dad had had one job his entire life, um, which is pretty <laughs> rare these days. Um, and uh, he, um, he literally is, it was a professor um, and uh, he was a psychology professor, but he didn't teach a whole lot. He was a research professor. So he ran a lab and he researched um, human cognition, the human learning process. Um, but when I was a kid, he wasn't working with human beings. He was working with rats and pigeons. So you would go into his lab and, you know, when it I was a little been kid. So was, much fun as a kid. <laughs> it, it was, it was, yeah, it was a little bonkers, um, especially because, you know, we didn't have the desktop computers and stuff that we have sure. now. This is a long time ago. And so you'd go into the lab. And there were these giant racks. The, the walls were all lined with these massive racks of like things and wires and flashing lights. It was like you were stepping into a space station or something. And then these chambers that they would put, you know, like the birds in to teach them sort of like Skinner chambers to like sort of like how to peck at things and then get rewards. And then they would, it's so funny to this day, I remember the way that they would carry the pigeons around. They'd take them from a cage. And apparently if you, put a pigeon like upside down um, in your hands or something like that, they become completely still. Um, mm -hmm. So they would sort of like carry the pigeon from one place to another that way. And then eventually, um, you know, he graduated to uh, students <laughs> and um, spent his entire life researching the human learning process. Um, he retired, I want to say five, six years ago. To this day, he's still doing all the same research, he's generated such a massive body of work and they're still processing so much of the data and reanalyzing the data that, you know, <clears throat> he's officially retired from work, but he's never stopped working because he absolutely loves what he does. Hmm. What was the area that he was working in specifically with, with psychology? Like what, what were these rats and pigeons uh, elucidating to, to, to him? Yeah. <clears throat> he was doing a lot of work around how we learn. Um, and in particular, um, 
how can we learn? There's, there's, um, I guess sort of like this holy grail of learning that's existed in that world um, that goes by various names, but he once described it to me as errorless learning. Like, huh. can you actually figure out a way to teach people to learn on a conceptual level where they don't have to go through, you know, like thousands of trials and errors and, and deduct the ideas and the theories from that and then figure it out. But could you actually dramatically accelerate that process? And um, so most of his work, you know, for, for, his entire um, academic life was focused around that question. I'm sure it's much more nuanced and complicated. I'm sure I got it wrong. Um, uh, you know, he's very, very academic. He published a ton and would speak a ton. And, um, you know, but uh, he is, you know, I think one of the things I got, you know, from seeing his devotion to work is this idea that, you know, he went to work every day and he loved what he did. Didn't mean every day was a good day. Didn't mean there weren't like stumbles and fumbles and living and working in the world of academia has all sorts of weirdness to it. You know, there's a lot of politics and all these crazy dynamics, but um, fundamentally, you know, like he started working and he did that thing um, for, for, you know, in, until he was <laughs> five, six years ago. Um, and like I said, he's actually still doing it. He's just not doing it in an academic setting now because it actually gives him more freedom to just focus on the, the parts of it that he wants to do. And he collaborates with people who still run labs to sort of keep it rolling. That's so interesting. Cause I'm just imagining now like growing up in that household with a father who probably is unimpressed by traditional schooling in America and the way it all goes down and a mother who's an artist and a hippie. And so you, was what what was emphasized the most when you were when you and your sister were were growing up and, and i guess the question i'm asking is you know a lot of times parents will echo certain mantras in the house to kids this is not important that's important and all of that what what what, what do you remember from when you were growing up your parents would tell you about the world or what to expect or what to look out for and things like yeah. that yeah so i would say my my dad actually probably was um you know, cause he came up through, um, academia and it was in his, you know, it literally in his blood, he, you know, did his PhD and, um, he went to Columbia and, um, so he was, I, I would say he was, you know, suspect of a lot of things, but also very much a fan of traditional school and academics. Mm -hmm. My mom, um, was, it's funny. Like if, if you, some people, um, would describe these days, um, my, my childhood is like free range kids, mm, you know, that's what it sounds there's, like. Yeah. Yeah. There's this movement, you know, like now where people are like, like, like parents just like hands off, man, let your kids go out there, let them get their knees scraped, let them stumble and bumble and learn and don't just run around trying to create the safest container possible and fixing everything before there's even a problem because your, your kids don't learn. They don't learn how to be resilient. They don't learn all these different things. And my folks were kind of like, it was the classic, you know, I get home, I, I knock out my homework and then I was outside until the, the sun went down, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I was just doing stuff in the neighborhood. Sometimes good stuff, sometimes not so good stuff, like every kid. Um, and I was fortunate to grow up in the, you know, like a fairly um, small town where, you know, like everyone knew everyone. And, uh, um, and, and I think, you know, like what they instilled in me is really, I, I was really blessed in a lot of ways. I, I knew I was unconditionally loved. Like I'm, I always knew I didn't have to earn somebody's love. You know, that was, it was just never even a question for me. I, di I didn't think about it because it was never on my mind. I never feared it. I never lacked it. And I've actually come to learn later in life that, that um, what I just took for granted and never, the fact that I never thought about that mm -hmm. is, is actually a huge blessing because that is not the reality for a lot of other people. Um, and I was given a lot of freedom to be who I wanted to be that I didn't have heavy expectations. I wasn't being tracked for, you know, like you have to do this and then you have to go to this school and then you have to have one of these four types of jobs um, in the way that so many are, you know, I was given a lot of freedom to really just be who I wanted to be and do what I wanted to do um, and stumble and bumble. Um, and, you know, and, and I would have to figure out how to pick up the pieces too. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, but um, we were 
fine. You know, the town that I grew up in was also a very wealthy town. There was a lot of money in the town. So, you know, we didn't have money where, you know, with, you know, on a school break of a whole bunch of kids, you know, if a class trip was going to some foreign country, I, I, I wasn't on those trips. <laughs> um, but I never really felt a sense of, of real lack, you know, and I think probably a lot of that in reflection is because I felt held, I felt loved, and I didn't have expectations about who or what I should be or who or what I should like do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I had a lot of time to play and discover who I was, I think, in a lot of different ways. Um, so there was never, there was not a lot of direct transmission in terms of teaching me. You know, like, or in terms of values, but um, I witnessed the choices that my parents made. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my mom hung out in a community for a lot of my upbringing of craft people, um, and they were weird. You know, they were like your typical artisan. They were eccentric and they were kooky, and you know, and they were into all sorts of like strange things, and um, and it was normal. For me and then my dad like you know on his side it was like yeah the academic side so it's it's almost like an interesting tension there like one is very much more buttoned down and academic oriented and linear and the other is like the exact opposite so um, were they interested in each other's work would your mom ask about your dad's work at dinner yeah, no. or your dad <laughs> would, he, would he look at your mom's pottery and go oh, that's amazing i really love that um <laughs> maybe a bit you know yeah. um we made like the family made some of our, you know, like quote family walking around money. Cause my mom would uh, on the weekends, she'd take all the stuff that she made and then right. she had, um, built a whole bunch of shells and displays and stuff. And we would do street fairs, you know, so she'd bring her wares out to like, you know, fairs on the weekend and we'd sell a bunch of stuff. So, you know, as kids were running around and we knew all the different vendors and stuff like that. And, but, you know, so it's almost like this little um, traveling family, people who showed up in the same places. Um, mm -hmm. But no, they kind of, they were very, very different people um, and lived in different worlds. I mean, they ended up splitting up when um, I was, I guess, junior, senior in high school. Sure. Um, and, um, and, and I think, you know, they were just, they were really, um, they're both good people um, and on very different people at the same time. Right. So you're a junior, senior in high school, you're a gymnast and your parents are splitting up. What did you see yourself becoming? Um, so I know you went to law school later, but in that moment in time, what did you think you were going to be in the world as an adult? Yeah. Law school was a weird left turn for me, but um, we, we can talk <laughs> about that at some point. Um, you know, coming out of high school, I had no sense of what I wanted to be, honestly. Um, I went to college. Um, I went to uh, what was then called SUNY Binghamton, like state school. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's called Binghamton University. They changed the name, so it sounds much fancier than it is. Um, <laughs> And uh, I bounced around, I knocked around, I studied a whole bunch of different kinds of classes. I was not a good student uh, in any mm -hmm. meaningful way. Um, not so much because I didn't have what it took, but because I, I kind of didn't care. Um, and I just really didn't apply myself. And also, I have loved music from the time I was a kid. Um, I've had a passion for music. I played music. Um, I played guitar. Um, in high school, I was also in a band. So I played guitar and bass and stuff like that. And, um, and I just love music of all different kinds. You know, it was always on in my house from Nina Simone to folk music, to country Joe and the fish to like Bach, you know, to, uh, there was everything on the turntable. And, Mostly from um, your mom, your mom playing music. Yeah, probably, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, man, I can still hear those Nina Simone songs in my head right now as I <laughs> remember that. Um, uh, so amazing. And, um, so I ended up in college and I didn't attend class a whole lot, but, um, I started, uh, to become a DJ, um, like a club DJ. Um, oh, wow. and, and then I, I built my own company, sort of like a DJ sound and lighting company there with a partner. So, you know, we were out playing at clubs you know, three nights a week and sending our people around to parties and big events. And we had tons of equipment and giant stacks of speakers and turntables and mixers, um, so was this I your got, first, your first business, your first venture? Yeah. I mean, I was a lemonade stand kid. So I always, I was always hustling <laughs> on the side, you know, right. and I was mowing lawns and doing the landscaping business in the summer, you know, cause um, yeah, I wasn't given a lot. So it was like, if I wanted something, I had to earn my own money. Um, right. And I, and I wanted stuff. Like I like nice stuff <laughs> yeah. and I have since I was a kid. 
Um, so it was always up to me. And, uh, but that was my first like legit business business. Um, yeah. It was also the first business that I sold. So when we graduated, we sold the company to um, some incoming freshmen, kind of like handed over the keys and we're like, hmm, that's pretty cool. So you can build something that's got so much value, you can exit it. But, um, but fundamentally it was, it let me create something which has been an impulse of mine, you know, showing up in so many different ways. And then uh, it let me wrap that around my love of music and technology and equipment and things. And also, um, you know, the, the art form of uh, DJing, not, not radio DJing, but like club DJing. I mean, yeah. it, is a, it is a real art. I mean, now we know, you know, you've got like Skrillex and like all these people who will have yeah. ten thousands and thousands of people like you know, EDM concerts. But back then, it wasn't really, I think, given its due, um, but it is a true I'm, art form. What What did you learn about people from DJing that you oh, didn't man. know before you started DJing? Yeah, this was like one giant Petri dish three nights a week. <laughs> like it was my experiment in human and social dynamics. It was incredible because I learned really quickly. I was like, for I could go for four to six hours and for that entire time, I could literally control the interactions and the social dynamics of, you know, three, four or 500 people. Um, and we would get past notes all the time. Hey dude, play a slow song. Cause I'm really trying to, <laughs> and, and you know what I learned, I always knew that music affected me in a really deep emotional visceral way, but mm -hmm. I saw how you could literally craft a sonic landscape that would affect the physiological and emotional states of people at scale and take them on a journey that would just like, you could literally be like, okay, so this is the moment in the evening where people's feet are no longer going to be touching the ground. Like uh, mm -hmm. it's liftoff time, mm -hmm. you know? And you're like, I'm going to take you to a place where like, you're no longer in the club. You know, you're just, you're just somewhere else. And we've all felt that, right? Like we've all been on that dance floor at 10 in the morning. And you, it just, it didn't matter where you were, you were somewhere else. And to see how you could literally craft and weave like this, this sonic narrative where, you know, you had hundreds of players and, and a container that you also wanted to be alive, but also safe, um, transcendent, um, but also bringing people down at the right moment so that they could mm -hmm. kind of like catch their breath and touch back in and, and make intelligent choices about what they were doing the rest of the evening. And um, there was so much, it's funny, I've never been asked that question, um, but I've thought about it a lot because I sometimes find myself reflecting on those times. And I'm like, this was not, I mean, it was crazy fun for me. I loved doing it. I felt like I was an artist behind the tables. Um, and I also learned so much about human beings. And there's another layer to this, which is that I'm introverted. Mm -hmm. You know, I love people, but uh, I'm, a, I'm on the quieter side and I love people sort of like in quieter elements. And by me stepping into that role, I could be surrounded by mass, you know, numbers of people. Um, but I was in my own like special place and I felt really good. So it was a way for me to define a role that allowed me to actually be immersed in the culture of the students and the school, but also carve out a way from, for the introvert in me to kind of like be cool and have my own protected space in that domain. Hmm. Okay, so um, how are you thinking about success in those days, if you can remember being in college? Because I remember when I was in college, you know, that was back, and you were probably not too far ahead of me, where people were going on Wall Street and working in investment banking and, you know, yeah. doing that whole thing. Wall Street, the movie was had been out. And so um, my dad was an entrepreneur. So he always talked about owning your own business. And so I, in my mind, that was the pinnacle of success, owning ownership and that kind of thing. What, what was your idea of success at that time? You know, it was probably money. Um, as odd as it sounds, based on what I've just shared about my upbringing, <laughs> um, it was that exact time. It was like, you know, I, I grad, you know, I was in college in the mid eighties. Um, mm -hmm. so I graduated in 87 and that sort of like pushed me out into the world where it was like, you know, back in the time where they called it the go-go eighties, -go you know, wall street was just everything. Like you said, the movie wall street, Gordon Gecko, greed is good. 
Um, and, and I was, you know, like, uh, I grew up outside of New York, but, um, you know, around the city a bunch. And, um, and I think probably because it started to probably dawn on me then in college that I liked making my own money. I liked running my own businesses. Um, and I wanted more of that. Um, and, um, and I, I liked what money gave me. And I, and then I started to see a lot of what was happening in the world, especially of finance and the stock market. And I was like, huh, um, I'm really interested in that. Um, I didn't study it in undergrad because I had no idea what I wanted to study because I basically never went to class. Um, uh, so I ended up majoring in poli sci literally because I couldn't figure out anything else to do. And I cobbled together enough classes to call it that. Um, but I, I got out of school. Um, I really didn't have a sense for what I wanted to do, but I, I felt like I got swept up in the energy of the day. And I, I was like, huh, Wall Street sounds really interesting. Money sounds really interesting. Um, I took a little bit of time off um, between undergrad and then eventually um, I was, I, I took my money actually from selling the business and I vanished into Australia for three months. Um, I threw a backpack on. I flew into what was then this tiny little backpackers haven um, called Cairns. Now it's actually like a much fancier resort town filled with like, you know, resorts and golf courses. And, um, and then, uh, navigated my way up to this little place called Cape Trib, which was like this remote little spot, Cape Tribulation, where the rainforest tumbled into like the tropical ocean. Um, and it was mm -hmm. magical. And I started diving on the reef. Um, and uh, was just scuba diving there um, and hosteling my way down the coast for three months. And I came back with like, you know, $3 in my pocket, basically, and <laughs> went back home, started doing outside sales and uh, realized I am not a good salesperson. And um, it was not a fun job for me. And, uh, and I, I was like, you know, what? I wasn't ready for the real world at that point, I think. Um, so law school for me was a way to gain a whole bunch of skills. I didn't know or even really expect to practice, even though I ended up practicing law. Um, but I thought also I started realizing, I was like, you know, I really screwed around in college and I really didn't test myself academically or in intellectually in any meaningful way. And I was really curious. I was like, I kind of want to really know what I'm capable of, you know? Um, and so law school, you know, for me, I decided to go because I... I figured no matter what happened afterwards, um, it would give me a lot of skills that would be transferable to anything I do. It would teach me how to think. It would teach me how to write. It would teach me how to argue. <clears throat> it's pretty arguable about whether it, how much of that it did, but it definitely got me down further down the road and understanding those things. Um, you had to and, bounce that off of somebody. Like, who did you talk to? or What did you read oh, yeah. to make I, that decision to go to law school? So I bounced it off my parents. And up until literally almost like the week before I went, it was a choice between law school or physical therapy school. Because I'm also <laughs> very, it's, I know, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. I'm very somatically wired too. I have a deep fascination with just sort of like human beings, how we live, how we move, and also the, the body. Like you referenced, I was a gymnast. I was a competitive gymnast until I was about 20. So a huge amount of my time was also spelt, spent training. And I was deeply fascinated with how the body works. Um, and anyone who knew me then had, could not understand why I chose law school instead of PT. Um, mm. Because physical therapy was so much more aligned with who I was. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what it came down to was um, the illusion of money, <clears throat> the chase of money. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, I was swept up at that moment in time in my life. I was like, I want some of that because um, I didn't come up with it. And uh, and I had a conversation with actually a friend's dad um, who knew I was grappling with these. And he kind of pulled me over one night. And he, I, it's literally to this day, I remember the words. He's like, hey, listen, um, I want to tell you something. Even a bad lawyer makes six figures every year. <laughs> <laughs> and as a young, impressional kid, you know, that actually landed with me. Um, yeah. Because there was something in me that wanted that at that season, during that season of my life. And that was a part of the reason why I ended up making that choice. Um, and, uh, and I don't not the choice. It actually was an incredible experience in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, and even the practice, even though I, you know, I practiced for four or five years and left it behind. 
but um, it was such an incredible learning experience in so many different ways. Taught me a lot about myself too. So you ended up at the Security Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. which is interesting. It's purely government job, probably the furthest you can get away from where your mom was had going on <laughs> when you were growing up. Um, what did you take away from that experience? Like, what did you learn about life from working at the Security Exchange Commission? Yeah, I am not wired for bureaucracy <laughs> or, or <laughs> politics. It is not in my blood. Um, I'm a straight shooter. I'm honest. I'm open uh, to the extent that I can be. And I don't like functioning in massive bureaucracies with politics and posturing and positioning and also massive amounts of inefficiency. One of the things that I loved and to this day I love about entrepreneurship and I founded a bunch of companies that you know until now is that um, I love being able to just have an idea, rapidly test it, iterate on it, see if it's good or not, and then scale around it if it is, and then walk away if it's not. Um, and it's both, um, you know, it's, I, I, I love being able to actually say yes to things that matter and no to things that don't. And when you're in a giant place like that, um, there's a lot of the opposite. Um, they're just astonishing levels of waste wasted resources, wasted time, wasted humanity. Not to say that there are bad people there. They're, they're not. I mean, there's a lot of good people. You wear the white hat you know, in those agencies most of the time, and you're working to doing good work and protecting people and being of service. And there's a lot of really good that came out of it. And I worked with and met a lot of really good people there. But the, the functional culture of that environment just really was not right for me. Um, mm. At the same time, I learned that, which was really powerful um you know there are a lot of stories about it that actually to this day i'm not i'm not sure if i'm allowed to talk about because when <laughs> the sec worked under the cover of secrecy I, I was so i was that like annoying person when you asked me what i did i was like i work for the sec but i actually can't tell you anything else <laughs> because we were investigating things under the cover of secrecy that if, the, right. if it became public you know billions of dollars and careers um would be like right. potentially decimated in a matter of seconds. Um, so I, we, it, it was an interest, really interesting environment to be in. Cause I worked in the New York office and New York was the enforcement division. Sure. So we were like deep into investigating um, the whole time. So most of what we did, the public never knew about. Hmm. Were you making your six figures? No, but here's the thing um, that, that particular agency, um, paid way better than what you would think your typical government agency paid. And also I was very fortunate when I, when I did go to school, I decided this is the time for me to work. So I worked really, really, really hard and graduated pretty close to the top of my class. So I had opportunities presented to me that were not necessarily available to everybody stepping out of that space. Um, and I also learned that the government has a different pay level for people who graduated at the top of their class, which is very bizarre and elitist, but, um, that, but uh, so I stepped into that, but, but also I had developed a fascination, you know, I was deepening into my fascination with the financial markets mm -hmm. um, and how they move and the psychology underneath them. It was not entirely dissimilar to my time DJing where right. I understood that like, you know, like everything is about social dynamics and, and mass psychology. And I learned really quickly about financial markets that it's, it's not about the fact it's about how people feel about the fact. Um, mm -hmm. so emotion, you know, was so, so understanding this was all just about human psychology. I was fascinated by that. Um, I thought I might leave the law and go into finance after that. Um, but I kind of felt like I real once I realized that this government, um, agency wasn't right for me, I was like, I can't, I just spent a lot of my own money. I like, I sold a lot of my own stuff to go to school and, <laughs> You know, um, I wanted to stick with it longer and see um, what I could do. So I ended up, um, after I did my time at the SEC, um, I was very fortunate to be able to, uh, to be invited into uh, one of the largest law firms in New York and in the world, actually working in, in their securities area with, you know, like IPOs and it's all the same stuff, but I had flipped sides. You know, we were doing deals now sure. as a lawyer there. Um, and you know, I got exposed to a whole different universe there. You know, you lose the money that 
in the money that was flying around and the deals that were being done was so obscenely large that you really lose a sense of reality mm. um, when you're playing in those domains. I think that happens to a lot of people when you're it's working. It's literally on, the game of Monopoly, but it's real money. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, oh, you're raising, you're like we're raising a fund and it'll be like a billion dollars. And you're like, you know, and, and the, the, the tiny contributor is 25 million bucks. It's like, ah, is it worth it to like make a phone call to them? <laughs> and like in hindsight, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, like, it's just so bizarre and so warped in so many ways. Um, but that's just the world, you know, and I was swept up in it for sure. Um, until that career basically like shut, shut me down physically. So yeah, you had some uh, immune problems or something like that. Right. And you're like 30, 31 years old. What was that like? Cause now I'm sure you're making your six figures Oh yeah, and you're seeing yeah. all this money, but how do you feel about yourself inside and Terrible. physically and mentally? Yeah, I'm, I'm crashing inside. I'm hard. And you're right. I'm making my six figures. I'm wearing my like really fancy suits. I've got the business card that everybody wants. Um, I'm, Do you I'm still have the seeing... gymnast body? You still no, have the six I'm, a, I'm a physical wreck at that point. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I'm not leaving the office. Like I'm, I'm basically working like 100 hours a week. Um, because when, you know, you get paid what I was getting paid, essentially you're turning your life over. Um, right. Especially in the early days, sort of like, you know, that's, you earn your chops, you know? Um, and no, within a matter of weeks, I was put on a deal and, uh, and I barely went home for probably three weeks. I was living on, you know, like chocolate, um, caffeine and takeout. And, um, and I was a physical and emotional and psychological and probably cognitive wreck, but wow. this is just kind of what we did. You know, this is, it's a day in the life. Um, and you, you do it in no small part, either because you love it, which wasn't me, or because you got your eye on what you hope is sort of like, you know, the carrot that's being dangled, which is partnership 10, 12 years down the road. And I had, could care less about that. I ended up, um, in such bad shape that, um, I was doing this one deal and two, three days before, um, I just felt this pain in the middle of my body. And I just ignored it and it got worse and worse and worse and worse until I could barely breathe. I was doubled over, but I'm still working and nobody's paying attention because everyone's in their own, you know, like hazy space. And we, we kind of hit the button on the deal. And um, I went home, I went straight to my doctor after passing out for a little bit. And then he looked at me and kind of turned a little bit white. He's like, there's something large inside of you that wasn't there a few months ago when I did your physical. Um, took me to an infectious disease guy within a matter of hours, I was checked into the hospital and had emergency surgery because I had a huge infection that had mushroomed into like, you know, like a baseball sized thing in the middle of my body um, and ate in a hole through my intestines from the outside in. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think the assumption back then was, you know, I think you probably had an infection brewing in you for a while and your immune system basically had nothing left because your body was in such bad shape. So it just mushroomed into this thing. Um, and uh, thankfully it all went really well, but I knew at that point I was on my way out. Um, um, but I didn't leave for the better part of another year because I wanted to figure out what the next step was gonna be. And as I started to realize I was gonna go back into the world of entrepreneurship and, and movement and well being and sort of human potential, I also realized that uh, I was gonna start over and very likely either make nothing or make all very a very small salary, especially compared to what I was making. Um, so I was working almost entirely just to make plans and bank money and give myself a cushion for the next step. This is the craziest part of the story to me. <laughs> um, because I think it would just be unfathomable for many people to leave a high paying job where you're literally toying with billions of dollars to becoming a trainer at a gym for $12 an hour. Yeah. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> so what did that your, my did ego you get, more than anything did you else. get pushback from your colleagues, your friends, your parents and anybody who were your supporters? Who was, who was, who was, who was cheering you on and who was like pushing back? Yeah. That, you, that made you um, really second you know, like re rethink this plan. Yeah. So my wife, um, 
you know, and our, our relationship was very young then, um, stood by me. Like we started dating when I was just graduating law school. So, Mm -hmm. you know, she, she starts a relationship with, you know, like a rising, like lawyer in the New York world, you know, like (laughs) finances and that, and all of a sudden it's like, uh, is making 12 bucks an hour wearing running shoes, tights and a ratty old t-shirt and run and playing with people in central park. (laughs) Um, but she was there for me, you know, and my family was, was there for me too. I don't think they understood what was going on with me. Um, but they gave me space to work it out. They weren't like pressuring. They weren't like, like you're making a hard, you know, horrible decision or, you know, again, it was one of these moments where when I reflect, um, unlike so many other folks, I was in such a fortunate place and met my parents who I, who I love and I'm close to did not just really place all of these expectations about what they thought was the appropriate decision for me on me. They were kind of like, they told me what they thought, um, but they were also like, it's your life, you know, um, do what you got to do. And, and that was a great gift, you know, um, for sure. Uh, a lot of my friends who I went to law school with <laughs> could not understand because um, I literally had the job that so many of us had worked so hard to get. Um, and it was not an easy job to get, and, um, there was a lot to it. And, um, so when I walked away, especially not to go to another job or not to become general counsel there, not to go in house with the client, which is what most people do if they leave and sort of like a mid-level associate, um, which, which is what it was, but literally like my departure memo, which got sent around the firm. Cause every time someone left, you sent a departure memo around, it was like, if it, it effectively said, Hey, I'm leaving. Uh, the law firm, but I'm also leaving the practice of law to um, go lead people up mountains and take them mountain biking and play with them in the park. Um, And the hush talk from the people who were at my level in the firm was not kind. Um, Mm. But the private notes that I got from people like senior partners in the firm, which basically said, God bless, go do this, do it now. Mm. That was really strong validation because these were the people that all the younger people were working to become. Right. And then some of those people were saying to me, you know what, man, go do this thing. Now, this is your choice. I like, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but this is the moment to try. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that helped bolster me a chunk, but it was still, there was a, there was a, you know, there was a minute of really wandering in the dark and wondering what I was doing. And, you know, waking up certain days and being like, am, am I completely like, is this in any way defensible? <laughs> um, right. Um, but I had planned for it. You know, like I knew I was going to go into a space of uncertainty and have to learn something from the ground up. So I went to the fitness industry was my first step out um, because I think it was, you know, being so somatically oriented and having abandoned it um, during my time in the law, I wanted to get back to it personally. Um, and also I was, I was really curious about the business and what was working and what was not working. And, um, and I just had a really strong sense that there was a lot that was not working. And there were a lot of people that were not being served and that there was a better way to do it. Um, and I want to learn it from the ground up. You know, I could have, I'm sure I could have found my way into a, a management level position in the industry and started there, but I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to learn what was happening on, on, the fundamental point of contact between you know, like a, a, one human being and another um, and on the floor of a gym, not too dissimilar to the floor of a dance club, right? There's a lot of threads that weave together. You know, mm-hmm. there's this big social dynamic. Um, you know, it's, it's humanity. It's all different parts of humanity mm-hmm. unfolding. Um, and I wanted to learn that. <clears throat> so I was okay, um, you know, doing the $12 an hour thing just to learn this from the ground up. But my ego took a little while to um, be okay with it. (laughs) Yeah. And you're also not just a trainer. I mean, you've been exposed to a world that most people will never know even exists, but they feel the effects of it every day without realizing it. So you're now thinking like a venture capitalist and you're thinking like a lawyer. So you're bringing all of that with you. So it's not just, let me learn how to teach people how to do this exercise. It's like, let me see how this business is built and how it it grows and how we can do it more efficiently and all of that. For sure. I mean, especially, you know, my time in the SEC, we spent a lot of time deconstructing businesses Mm -hmm. to understand where things went sideways. Um, And 
that blended with my own experience with my own businesses um, it allowed me to see a lot of different things. And, you know, <laughs> stepping into the floor as a personal trainer um, with a background in law and finance, when a lot of the clients who can afford um, that level of service have similar backgrounds, it actually gave me a really interesting competitive advantage because mm -hmm. I had, I could have conversations and rapport with many mm -hmm. of my clients about things that were really unusual for somebody. It must've been space. shocked that you knew some of these yeah, things. Totally. <laughs> right. the I'd, I'd start, I'd start talking to them about the markets um, in the, like, a, you know, what I thought was a sophisticated way. I have no idea if it really was or not, but, um, and yeah, you would see like the eyebrows raised and their head would cock be like, wait, what? Like, you know, this stuff. Cause you know, we all make assumptions about people. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's awesome. All right. So I want to flash forward a bit. We don't have to get into so many details around um, what happens next. You sold, you sell your, your help, your wellness business. You leverage that um, a little bit later at a very peculiar time. And I, I would say, looking at your whole trajectory, you have a knack for timing. You have a really good knack for timing. And let's just yeah, talk about this first good, example. But, but there's definitely a knack. So like, no, it is definitely... good. It is good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll tie that together in a minute, but talk about leasing that floor of the building and, and the circumstances yeah. around that. Yeah. So I, I, I had, um, I had opened my own facility, like in the fitness world and grew for two and a half years and sold it to some investors. And then I got curious about the yoga world. Um, I had developed my own practice. I was very, very young in the practice, but it actually started with breathing because as a lawyer, I was so stressed out that I needed mm. something to help sort of like downregulate my system really quickly. Um, I would find myself sort of like hyperventilating on adversarial calls. And I was like, this is not okay. So I, I started with pranayama and then I really became attracted again, sort of like the somatic side and the asana and the movement and um, I got curious about the business as that's just kind of the way that my mind works. Um, sure. And I scanned the universe in New York and I was like, oh, there's a lot of great studios back then. I mean, it's nothing like it is now. Um, but also a lot of them were steeped in certain parts of tradition that were very off-putting um, to people who were not yet a part of the traditions. Um, and I wanted to create something that was different, something that was accessible. Um, mm -hmm. So I got this idea in my head. Um, uh, I'm walking by a space a couple blocks from where our apartment was then in Hell's Kitchen, New York. And uh, it looked like literally like a bomb, bombed out sort of like, you know, floor in a 115 year old building. Um, but I looked inside, I was like, oh, we could turn this into something really cool. So I signed a six year lease for that floor in a building, three blocks from our apartment, um, new home, married, three month old baby. And the date I signed the lease was uh, September 10th, 2011. It was the day before 9-11. 2001. Um, 2001, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, woke up to um, you know the, the awfulness on every level. That was 9-11 in my city, in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, at least one person um, who was a friend who didn't come home that day. And um, it was a really powerful moment for me. Cause it really brought home the fact that we have no promises, right. you know? Um, and, and, and immediately I was wondering, you know, like, who do we know who's in the towers? Um, Cause pretty much every New Yorker like knew somebody. Um, yeah. And, and then I was like, am I really going to launch a business into this? You know um, I got a, I got a family <laughs> and, and, and I, I need to do what I can to take care of them emotionally, psychologically, and financially, especially then. Um, but the moment that knowing that I knew somebody who didn't come home um, and the, the devastating effect it had on their family, um, that was, it was one of the things that along with a bunch of other just emotions and feelings and experiences um, really reminded me that um, we just have one pass through and I want to make the best use of my time. And to me, opening a business that was not just a business, but was a place of community and healing and breath and movement. Um, was the thing to do um as scary as it was i mean it's scary to launch a business in the best of times it was terrifying to launch it then and but we did um and eight weeks later we launched uh the center and we just sent i mean people were walking around then literally um 
we're literally just wandering around the streets in a daze, in a complete and utter daze. Nobody knew what to do. People just wanted to do something to help and to feel better, but nobody knew what to do, you know, and the smoke still filled the air all the way up to Midtown. And it was a very bizarre, surreal, sorrowful, painful moment. But to be able to create something where we could bring people together in a safe space and join them in movement, join them in, in music, join them in breath, join them in just a, being allowed to feel in community was astonishing. So we went forward with that. Um, and, you know, because of, of that, it, you know, we grew into a, a big, a successful community and also a successful business on the back end of that. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a really powerful experience. And again, you know, on the one hand, you could say right moment, right time. On the other hand, you could say like absolutely not right moment and not right time because, you know, it would have been a whole lot easier to open something in the best of times with good economics and doing all sorts of things. But um, in terms of sort of like um, having meaning, you know, and knowing that we were doing something, we were playing a part that was much bigger than what I ever conceived. And, you know, it, it was a really powerful experience um, that that has really stayed with me in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I mean, I think that experience, I was living in New York at the time and I was, mm -hmm. I was uh, about three or four years into my yoga practice at the time. And I remember there were only being a handful of yoga studios. Yeah. There's Om, there was Jiva Mukti. Jiva Mukti, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe a couple of others. I was going to Equinox a lot, taking their yoga classes. So I remember when Sonic opened actually. And yeah. um, and I feel like that experience, it reintroduced New York City to community, to, to connection with one another. People were all of a sudden very friendly with one another. And so I think that, you know, for the purposes of building a community that you really can't get a better time than people actively seeking out you know, I need to know who my neighbors are because I was in their living room during 911 and I didn't even, never met them before. And, and, you know, we just were just started talking and, and asking each other how we were doing and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's interesting because reflecting now, um, in my experience of that moment was the, the six months or so following it. I mean, I was in my own altered reality. I was like launching a business and trying to be there for my, my wife and, and baby girl at that time. Um, but also there was this profound sense of, of brotherhood and sisterhood and fellowship um, and just wanting to take care of each other that lasted, you know, for three, four, five, six, seven months. Upon reflection, I've since learned, you know, like, while that was my experience, that was not in fact the universal experience that, you know, if you didn't look like me, if you uh, were a sick or if you appear to present in any way, shape or form to be uh, Middle Eastern, Mm -hmm. um, that you became an instant subject of violence, mm -hmm. um, and, and of ostracism. And, you know, my experience of profound, both sorrow, but then also fellowship, um, and, and, and open arms and shared humanity. Um, I've learned since then, you know, like for, for others, it became an absolutely terrifying, um, for very good reasons, time to be in this country. And, um, you know, I was blind to a lot of that um, for a long time. Um, it was really um, a, a conversation and, and sort of like seeing the work of Valerie uh, Kaur, who helped open my eyes to a lot of that also, um, who, who uh, grew up as part of the Sikh community, Sikh faith, um, and, um, you know, sharing the experiences uh, and then hearing the news stories, which really didn't land then um but and upon reflection i think as i've sort of expanded my my intentional re-examination of sort of like my place uh and and what society really is and isn't all about um yeah i, I have a different frame on on mm -hmm. that time now I, I know what my experience was but i also know that that was not the experience you know it was profoundly different depending on who you were right and you went ahead to sell that seven years later, you, in, you, in the process, you innovated video yoga and all these kinds of really yeah. cool things and started good life project. You have mentioned that you started thinking about spark type decades ago. So when yeah. exactly did that first bubble up in your awareness? 
Yeah, I think it was actually 9-11, to be honest with you. Um, I think it was that moment when I started, you know, asking the big questions and saying, you know, um, and realizing how important it is to use whatever time we've got and and realizing that, you know, most of our time for most of us is going to be spent working. Um, uh, depending on who you ask and depending, you know, like on who you are, you know, mm-hmm. you spend something like a third of your life sleeping, uh, a third of your life working and a third of your life doing random other stuff. Um, <laughs> but these days, I think actually that's not true. These days, I think people spend more than a third of their life working. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the average work week has gotten expanded pretty substantially. Um, there is a, um, you know, very little differentiation. There's very boundaries have kind of fallen away with the connectivity and technology, the expectation that you're always sort of like on for so many people is there. I mean, you know, this, because this is, this is something that you've like been so intentional about not stepping into or really defining exactly the way that you want to live in a way that most people haven't. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I got the, the seeds were planted then because I could just got really curious about how people were showing up and living their lives more broadly. And I think that's where good life project really found its seed. Like, how do we live a good life? Like, what are the components of that? But part of that was always work, you know, and really, so the seeds were planted back then. And, but I've really focused in a lot more in the domain of work, probably in the last five to 10 years and really kind of said, okay, so what is this thing called work and how do we, how do we both show up and contribute it to the world in a meaningful way, but also do it in a way that gives us back a sense of meaning and purpose and access to flow states and feeling like we're fully expressed and we're excited and energized to do the thing that we want to do. You know, because if you look around and you ask most people if they feel that in the context of what they're doing, the answer is no. Or if, right. if, if it's a yes, it's like a fleeting thing. Um, and they felt it here, they felt it there. They don't know why, and they have no idea how to repeat it, how to replicate the feeling, let alone like the notion of making it a sustained thing. And, and for the few people that do, um, it usually comes from a place of profound service and sacrifice, which can be really, really important. Um, but there are also other ways. Um, we, we all access that feeling, that state in different ways. And I got curious about it, you know, because I would, you know, know an artist from, you know, who is deeply, deeply fulfilled and they basically exist in their own creative cave. And they're not like in their mind, they're not like, Ooh, I'm making art to be of service to this person or to this community yet. They Mm -hmm. are utterly um, alive and, and they have a profound sense of purpose. And I was like, we're missing pieces of the puzzle. You know, what are, what are like, that we've got like little, little drips of answers. Um, but there's gotta be more and that, you know, it, uh, it sort of started to form into a bit of a quest over a period of years. Great detail. I love that. I loved also, I, I did the audio version of the book at the cool. end of the audio version. You have those personal testimonials, which I found yeah. really, it kind of tied everything together because the book itself, it's, it's very categorized and you, you, you go into detail about each one but to hear their personal stories and testimonials was really beautiful so thanks for adding that bonus content to the book yeah that was really fun i mean literally like the week before we put it out i was like wouldn't it be cool to just reach out to a whole bunch of people who are in the book and get quick updates from them you Mm -hmm. know in and so and you you hear it on the tape like this is not a produced thing you know some of them are literally like speaking into their voice memos walking down the street in brooklyn some of them i was able to get on the phone but it's all it's real you know it's real human beings with their real stories sharing their updates and it was really fun to be able to do that so yeah yeah so thanks for that um last couple questions number one is um how are you thinking about success these days jonathan after all these experiences (laughs) yeah um meaning and love, meaning and love and being present, you know, in, in being present in my life and being present in the lives of those that I, I cannot get enough of. <laughs> uh-huh. And, uh, and what's now that you, this is, to me, it seems like this is your life's work. You've been working on it for a couple of decades. Is this, are you working on some other expression of spark or is the book and the <sighs> website and all that kind of where you are for right now? Yeah, no, we're definitely growing. Um, you know, cause, cause when the, when the assessment came out, everyone's like, give me more. So now the, and, and, you know, 
from the giant data set, we had then a mountain of stories come. So now like all these like stories and um, observations and applications and use cases, and that all ends up in the book because it needs a way to get out of my head. <laughs> um, so then beyond the book though, um, yeah, folks are still saying, get you like, show us how to actually in a practical way, integrate these things into our work, into the, the choices that we make into for organizations, into leadership structures and training and things like that. So yeah, we're, we're in um, hardcore development mode with sort of like the next evolution of ways to help. And what's your archetype, your sparkotype? I'm my, the, the same as you on the top side. So I'm a maker scientist also, Okay. but on okay. the, my anti is essentialist, which is all about creating order from chaos systems and processes that work. I love the fact that um, we have people on our team that do it. Um, and yeah. I'm so happy. Like that work kind of makes me want to cry. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, man, I'm looking forward to Sparkotype for meeting your soulmate and Sparkotype for dating and right? yeah. <laughs> the single Sparkotype app to match you up with, with uh, another maker or whatever you are. And, uh, and I love the fact that we went to, I wasn't, I didn't, had, I hadn't read about the DJing experience. So I love the fact that we, we uh, hit on that because it did tie into a lot of the things that happen later. And I, I often find that what hap- what people experience as children, as young adults will often play a role in them finding their purpose for those of us who have identified a purpose or a passion. And, um, and so I just want to acknowledge you, man, for uh, this breadth of, of work that you're gifting to the world and uh, helping us make sense of things. And just thank you so much for all the leaps of faith that you've taken that have gotten you to this point. And um, just honored to call you a friend. And so thank you again Uh, for coming on to the show. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.